Okay, welcome everyone again. So um, two weeks ago, we did pride part one, basically, which was talking about the effect of pride of our, on our lives um, and how it originated. And now we're going to be looking at the dangers of homosexuality and what the Bible has to say on the topic. As we all know, it is Pride Month in much of the world in which um, LGBTQIA individuals celebrate what they are. And when you speak out against it, you are often ostracized. And we're just gonna tackle how we can communicate like our beliefs as well as you know where we as Christians are to stand on this topic. Okay, let's dive in. So let's talk about what homosexuality is, right? So a homosexual is a person, a male, who commits sodomy with another male, sometimes of the active participant and exclusively as opposed, exclusively as opposed to the passive. Um, the concepts of same-sex relationship and activity includes cultural and religious perceptions related to homosexuality, which also includes, you know, homoeroticism, um, homosexual intercourse, LGBT, lesbian, sodomite, sodomy, all those are, you know, um, just, I guess, bunched under homosexuality, right? Um, it's the quality of or characteristic of being sexually or romantically attracted to attracted exclusively to one to one's own sex or gender people of one's own sex or gender it is sexual relations between people of the same sex when discussing homosexuality the bible emphasizes behavior and the verdict is that it is always sinful okay so here are four questions we're going to try to answer in this session. First, are there instances of homosexuality in the Bible? Was Sodom and Gomorrah destroyed because of homosexuality? What is the Bible's stance on gender? And what effect of, you know, what is the effect of homosexuality on society today? And how can we combat its effects? So we have quite a, a discussion ahead of us. So let's get into it because this is rather long and I'd love to finish within the time frame. And I know there will probably be questions. Okay, so I've heard many arguments in favor of homosexuality. One of them is that interest in the same sex is part of human evolution. And that's especially harped upon if the people who are saying this believe in Darwin's theory of evolution, which is false. And already they're wrong, right? They claim that people who change their genders as well trans, they call them, are evolving. That is their final evolution, right? This ideology or any argument made in affirmation of homosexuality and the changing of genders is in direct defiance of God, and it is a gross misin misinterpretation of the scriptures. In the beginning, God created male and female, and he said they were very good. He made Adam and Eve as intended, and then created the institution of marriage between a man and a woman. It says, therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. And that is found in Romans chapter 1, verse 24. Sin causes a downward spiral. Down, 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 down. It's a sad life history, but it is the experience of all who run from God. And Paul says that all men and women do run from God, trying to rearrange the universe to fit their own desires. In Romans, Paul marks this downward lemming-like rush of the human race in three stages. And let's get into that. The first stage of degeneration is part of the verse that we read in Romans chapter 1 verse 24, which talks about God giving them over to the sinful desires of their heart. I do not know why 
when he set out to trace his downward moral path of human beings, the Apostle Paul concentrated on sexual sins, since he could have clearly chosen other sins as well. Perhaps it is because sexual sins are so visible, the sins of the spirit are harder to detect, or because the damage in this area is so evident, or because it was the obvious stinking cesspool of corruption in his day and therefore something those to whom he was writing would clearly understand. Whatever the reason, and there may be even more reasons than this, it is an excellent example. Sex is a wonderful gift, a gift imparted to the human race by God. It is a gift to be enjoyed, but it is to be enjoyed within the bounds of marriage, not outside of marriage, and above all, not in tank casual entanglements. If it is, the result is always what Paul declares it will be, namely impurity and the degrading of one's body. And we see that a lot that, you know, you've heard of hookup culture. We see it a lot in today's society. So that is impure. That culture is impure and it degrades our body temple. So let's continue. Um, it is evident that hardly anything in Romans chapter one is more contemporary so far as our own culture is concerned. Today, we are witnessing a frantic pursuit of pleasure that has been called rightly, even by secular media, the new hedonism. That is, ours is, a, is seemingly a culture in which casual sex and every other casual pleasure is ideal. And it is an ideal that has been actualized by many. With what results? At the start of this path, the prodigal son would no doubt extol it for its freedoms. He would speak of being free to think new thoughts, have new experiences, and shake off all that old inhibiting sense of guilt that had bound him previously. But given time, the, ch the feeling changes and the one who is running away becomes comes inevitably to feel used, taken advantage of, dirty, and betrayed. So Romans chapter one, verse 26 to 27, would anyone on, online like to read the verse on the screen? I'll read it for you. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For the women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passions for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. Thank you so much, Jesse May. So we see that in the time that Paul lives, it's basically the same as the time that we are currently living in, because in so as many words, this describes homosexuality. So the second stage is um, basically talking about you know, sexual revolution. I wrote a moment ago that there is nothing more contemporary in terms of today's culture than Paul's description of a declining society in this great first chapter of Romans. This has been clear already in terms of today's forms of hedonism and the sexual revolution. Unfortunately, the decline becomes even more apparent as Paul, with almost shocking candor, begins to talk about sexual perversions, namely lesbianism and male homosexuality. For centuries, these matters were hardly spoken of in Western society. Although some were no doubt practicing these acts, they were considered so reprehensible that a moral person not only was not to speak about them, but he or she was not even to know what such vices involved. But today, today they are written about with explicit detail in virtually every newspaper and magazine in our land. Grade school children discuss them. Not only are we not shocked, but we've become complacent as if it were a natural expression of an upright spirit. Natural is the important word here. Paul uses it in verse 27 and the opposite term, unnatural, 
in verse 26, because it explains why this stage is further a further step down the along the moral path. So the first stage was um, basically sexual impurity, right? And the degradation of the body. The next is the complacency or the tolerance of homosexuality. And we see that in today's day and age, as, it, as we, we read here, it's talked about and normalized in form, all forms of mainstream media. And it's not frowned upon and it's very explicit in mainstream media as well. I mean, and now people have, um, you know, two dads and two moms on, on television and whatnot. And it's just feeding the masses that, oh yeah, this is okay. Like I can say for sure that when I was growing up and that was not that long ago, I had no idea about any of these things. None of these things matter to me because I did not even know that they existed, right? And now after, after President Obama went into, um, into, into office, now all of a sudden, I've, all of these things are coming to the forefront and it's become part of Western culture. And it's really sad to see. Okay, so and let's elaborate on that statement. Fornication and adultery, which are in view in verse 24, are not on natural sin, for they are not against nature. Of course, they are true sins, for they break the moral law of God. They result in impurity and in the degrading of our bodies, as Paul says. But they are not unnatural. On the contrary, they are in one sense quite natural. They are accomplished by using one's body in a natural way. This is not so with homosexuality. Homosexuality is unnatural and it is accomplished by using one's body in an unnatural way that is against nature, against what God intended. In the first case, we may well need the Bible to tell us that fornication is wrong. The popular song asks, how can it be wrong when it seems so right? But in the case of homosexuality, we do not even need this special revelation. A look at one's sexual apparatus should convince anyone that practices of this kind are not normal. They were not meant to be. Okay? Perhaps this is why at this point and at no other point in his discussion of the results of our rebellion, Paul speaks of a specific judgment upon the sin itself. In verse 27, it says, men committed indecent acts with other men and received in themselves the, pen the due penalty for their perversion. Up to this point, Paul has not been saying that God punishes these or other particular sins with particular penalties, but rather that the abandonment of human beings to committing to the committing of the sin is itself the punishment. That is, God punishes you by letting you do what you want, but not here, at least not only that. Here, Paul speaks of a particular penalty received within themselves by those who sin in this way. And um, the LGBTQ community, they are, they have a lot of, you know, diseases. Set, of course, those who practice impurity and um, fornication and whatnot also have sexually transmitted diseases, right? But there's a lot of AIDS that goes a lot around in that community. And it's specific to them right and yes it it it's it's really painful to to hear about because that's an autoimmune disease and you can never heal from that right so hiv and aids we can we can interpret that that's what that means right it says is paul speaking of aids which is acquired immune immunodeficiency syndrome no which he wouldn't know right? Because he had never heard of AIDS, though he was probably thinking at least in 
part of other sexual diseases, but the point is irrelevant. What Paul is saying is that sin does and will have consequences and unnatural sins will have particularly unnatural consequences. See, Paul didn't know about AIDS or what existed or where it came from back then, right? But we, having the research that we have now, we can see where it come from and the result that it that happens to the body, right? So even though Paul might not have been speaking about it, we can see that that's how, that's how the world is. That, that's how, you know, when you commit sin, there is a consequence. And this is often the consequence that, you know, pe these people suffer from. Okay, Romans 1 verse 28 says, furthermore, since they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, he gave them over to a depraved mind to do what, must, what ought not to be done. Okay, so what does that mean, right? So the first, remember the first stage is sexual impurity, you know? Um, basically hookup culture or whatnot. Second is homosexuality. Third is, let's, let's check it out. The first time I began to think about this threefold repetition of the sentence, God gave them over in this section of Romans, it seemed to me at this point, something was apparently wrong with the order. Paul is tracing a downward declining path resulting from humanity's re rebellion against God. Yet here, the order doesn't seem to be downward. We can understand that when men and women abandoned God, God abandoned them. First to sexual impurity, second to sexual perversions. That is surely downhill. But now we find that God abandons them to a depraved mind. Isn't that something that should have come first? Doesn't sin originate in the mind? Shouldn't the third of these consequences have been listed first before the other two consequences? I was puzzled by this sequence until I realized that the depraved mind about which Paul is writing is not just any sinful mind. He has earlier talked about the generally foolish minds and generally darkened hearts of human beings but about a specifically depraved mind created by continuing down this awful path for a lifetime. At the end is a mind not merely foolish or in error, but it is totally depraved. It is a mind so depraved that it begins to think that what is bad is actually good and what is good is actually bad. May I say it? It is the mind of the devil, which is what Adam chose to pursue when he, he followed the dangling carrot. You will be like God, knowing good and evil. Adam did not come, did not become like God, knowing good and evil. Ironically, he became like Satan. And being like Satan, in time, he came to call the good bad and the bad good. How else can one explain man's continual flight from him who alone all good gifts come from? Mm. The evidence of this bottom stage of depravity is disclosed in verse 32 at the end of Romans. Although they know God's, great, God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do those very things, but also approve of those who practice them. The new word here is approve. It is not only that people do what is sinful. A person might do that, be ashamed of his or her action, and then repent of it. But here, at the very end of this awful downhill path of judicial abandonment, described in this chapter of Romans, the individuals involved actually come to approve or affirm what is evil. How do you appeal for good to a person who has become like that? Every argument you could possibly use would be divert reversed. 
that case is hopeless. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. And you know what? As a society, we see a lot of that today, right? In, in mainstream media and just like mainstream, society is just approving or saying that you have to, you have to affirm or you have to accept, you know, these things, these perversions and approving of what is evil. It's, it's sad to see. So those are the three stages of de degeneration or a downward moral spiral. The first one is sexual impurity. The second one is sexual perversion or homosexuality. And the third is being given to a state of depravity of mind. Okay, so let's continue. Sexuality has become prevalent in mainstream media. First, it was nudity, then explicit scenes on te television were normalized, and finally, hookup culture was encouraged. But the people who made movies and dominated the music industry in Hollywood became so bored with these things that they dabbled in homosexuality and it bled down into mainstream media. Now the LGBTQIA whatever agenda is being pushed and the widespread acceptance of homosexuality has opened the door to discourse about sexualities, gender identity, pronouns, and the like. And it is the children and the youth who are most impressionable that suffer the most from this. So what homosexuality distorts God's purpose for mankind? How? So first we have gender. God has only created male and female. However, sin has distorted his creation and made mankind unhappy with how we were created, right? We don't want to be in the roles that we were assigned. Then we have the rainbow. Through Satan's leading, the meaning of the rainbow has been corrupted. Where it was once a promise, it is now the meaning or it stands for pride, which is the first sin. Then we have marriage. Sin has destroyed distorted the original purpose for marriage. People see it as a means to an end or to have children or for love, but God, God instituted it to glorify himself. And these days people say that, you know, same-sex marriages are just as meaningful and just as sanctified as, as you know, heterosexual marriages, which is not so. And then the image of God is distorted as well. Homosexuality destroys the image of God in man and disregards God's will. Man makes, remakes himself into his own image and also uses his body for evil in unnatural ways. So let's talk about homosexuality in the Bible. So when I you know, did the study and I was thinking about it, I looked at it through the lens of the Bible. In the Garden of Eden, God placed many trees for Adam and Eve to partake of, but there was only one they were not to eat. Similarly, mankind has a choice of anyone in the world of the opposite sex to marry or to be with. And yet, people feel so constricted by God's directive that they choose to cultivate same-sex attraction and relationships. They go for the one tree that they're not supposed to go from. Not only that, but a propensity towards homosexuality often stems from having been molested and abused as a child, which is sad. It often stems from sin. Sin breeds sin. We all know this. It may also be the lack of fulfillment in a parental relationship and people end up looking for that specific love elsewhere. Whatever it is, remember that no one was born homosexual. They may have tendencies towards it due to a sinful nature, but no one was born homosexual. It's important to remember that we were all made in God's image and God made us exactly how we were meant to be, and it is sin that distorts our nature, okay? As Christians, we are to love everyone. However, we are not to affirm them in their wrongdoing. Christ's example was to love the sinner but hate the sin. 
homosexuals often hate Christians because they say no to that they say no to what we believe or what they believe, sorry. However, this group of people are so blatant about their sin that they make it the foundation of their entire character and personality and it becomes difficult to separate the sinner from the sin because they identify as a sin. Christianity.com says, it isn't being judgmental to simply repeat what the Bible says is Christian activity and what isn't. Sin is defined by God in his word. We are meant to read God's word and understand it. Furthermore, no Christian should ever want to identify personally with a sin for which Christ died. The hyphenated coupling of the word Christian with activities for which Christ Jesus died is a recent phenomenon that has no justification in either scripture or church history. Understood this way, the, the term gay Christian makes about as much sense as murderer Christian or adulterer Christian. Sin is not a label. It is what we have been freed from, right? Sin is the lack of conformity to God's holy requirements in the Bible. It begins with a false view of God and then breeds disregard for God and ultimately gives birth to attitudes and actions contrary to God's moral will. But sin also has a destructive effect upon the sinner. Sin leads to a hollow, unfulfilled human soul. And then when you're hollow and unfulfilled, you are miserable and misery loves company, right? As Christians, we don't hate LGBT people. In their confusion, LGBT proponents distort the God-ordained beauty of human sexuality and cannot rest until everyone applauds their behavior. This is incredibly sad. Why must it be skewed as hate to disagree with and yet have sympathy for such tragic people? Flawed views of God cause them to think that he's either non-existent or he's up in the heavens waving his rainbow banner of approval right along with them. Weighty chains bind their soul to empty promises of fulfillment that do not ultimately deliver. Only the short-sighted Christian cannot bring himself to pity or show kindness to a fellow human caught up in such deadly lies. It's also important that to notice that, you know, when you speak your views or you speak the Bible truth to them, they often take it as an insult. And if you don't applaud them, right, they have issues with you. That is very totalitarian behavior because people do not allow you to differ. These people do not allow you to differ in your opinions, right, or in your beliefs. You must agree with them and what they say goes. They are not God and they were not, nobody made them God. God did not give them that kind of authority, right? So it's, it's you know, we don't hate them, but we do pity them because they are blind. They are so very blind. The feelings of same-sex attraction are often unwelcome and spontaneous for those who are tempted to engage in homosexuality. It is not sinful to be tempted. What it is sinful to do is to yield. This truth about temptation applies to everyone, regardless of the sin. Those saying that homosexuality should be affirmed in the name of Christian love directly contradict the Bible. So here on the screen, we have Jude chapter 1, verse 7. Would anyone like to read this for me as we continue on to homosexuality in the Bible? Justly, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued our natural desires, serve as an example by undergoing punishment of eternal fire. Thank you so much. Okay, so some pro homosexual interpreters have claimed that the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah was not homosexuality per se, but homosexual gang rape. While it is accurate to say that the men of Sodom sought to rape Lot's guests, the text does not indicate that the sex would have been acceptable if only, angelic, only the angelic visitors had consented. 
Also, the fact that God's judgment came upon two entire cities and those surrounding it argues that it was not just the one instance of gang rape in Sodom that was an offense to God. Instead, God announced plan to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah before the rape incident occurred indicates that the practice of homosexual behavior in both cities was an affront to the holiness of God. When homosexuals demand to car when the homosexuals demanded to carnally know Lot's guests, they were merely attempting to do again what they had been doing for some time. Lot protested, "Do not act wickedly." Also, you can read this story in um, Genesis 19. But long before this, when Lot initially pit pitched his tent towards the city, we read that the men of Sodom were wicked exceedingly and sinners against the Lord. Again, before the attempted gang rape, God said, this, their sin is exceedingly grave. And Abraham also mentioned that they were wicked. Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 49 to 50. Behold, this was the guilt of your sister Sodom, she and her daughters had pride, excess of food, and prosperous ease, but did not aid the poor and needy. They were haughty and did an abomination before me, so I removed them when I saw it. Another pro-homosexual interpretation is that the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah was inhospitality and not homosexuality or homosexual rape. An appeal is made from Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 49, which we just read, that Sodom was judged for violating the hospitality code. From this passage, the claim is made of Genesis 19 that the men of Sodom wanted to know Lot's guests only in the sense of getting acquainted with them. However, the Hebrew word yara is used in a sexual way in the Old Testament at least 10 times, and half of these uses occur in Genesis. Added to this, the context of Genesis 19 argues for the sexual meaning of to know. It makes no sense to say that yada, the word yada, means acquainted with in verse 8, where Lot says, to his says that his daughters had not known any men. Certainly, they were acquainted with the men of the city, but they had not sexually known any men. The inhospitality interpreters also point to the absence of any mention of homosexuality in other pa passages that hold up Sodom and Gomorrah as examples of judgment. There are also several problems with this approach. First, these texts do not include homosexuality. In the case of Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 49, sexual sins could be, should be viewed as a form of selfishness. But the next verse, which is verse 50, shows that the sin was sexual by calling it an abomination. And we read earlier that, um, you know, the, wait, let me go to the next slide. Let me not jump ahead. So Leviticus chapter 18, verse 22 says, you shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. There it is, plain, simple, straight, right? In Leviticus chapter 18, verse 22, this is the same word used to describe homosexual sins. Most of all, the problem with this view is that the second Peter and Jude passages do link the judgment of the cities to the sexual sin of homosexuality, and this does not contradict in any way the ju other judgment passages. For this reason, those who take the authority of scripture will seriously will reject the pro-homosexuality inhospitality view, right? And even if people have difficulties like understanding that, by God's grace, the Holy Spirit is comes upon them and explains to them because you know the bible never contradicts itself first of all what god says he means and he never changes what he says second of all misinterpreting the bible is not the way to go because if anybody changes the scriptures yeah that's that's punishment that's coming for them 
Leviticus chapter 20, verse 13 says, if a man lies with a, a male as with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood is upon them. So now let's talk a little bit about gender, right? Many people say gender and biological sex are different things. They say that gender is a social construct, just as how they say race is a social construct. This is false. God instilled gender from the very beginning of time in the Garden of Eden. Isaiah chapter 3 verse 9 says, For the look on their faces bears witness against them. They proclaim their sin like Sodom. They do not hide it. Woe to them, for they have brought evil on themselves. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 to 11 says, would anyone online like to read that for me? Yes, or... Okay. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Thank you so much. Okay, so let's continue. So having keep all of those texts in mind on, you know, what God intends for us and, you know, what it means to be washed from sin right? So a person's gender identity reflects how they define what it means to be a human being. That self-definition will either correspond to God's revelation in his word, or it will not. As we have seen, God has created human beings in his image as male and female. Our identity, therefore, is defined by God in his purposes for his creation and in his new creation in Christ. The design of humanity is purposeful and good. And part of our design is that we are men and women. To, de to deny or overturn that distinction is to nullify God's re revelation in both nature and in scripture. The Bible calls it suppressing the truth in unrighteousness. The attack on gender and identity is a newer argument that has risen from the prevalence of homosexuality. The trans non-binary movement takes the ideology, ideology of queerness to a new level by labeling people and putting them into boxes using pronouns. People have lost the definition of who they are, especially because they disregard God and are now making their confusion everyone's problem. They take the beauty and specialness of the role of a man or a woman, which God assigned at birth, and distort it until it is completely different than what God created it to be. Through diversity and inclusion, these, these individuals are forcing everyone into, to, sorry, to buy into their lies and their own strong delusions. And if you speak against it, it's going to be a problem. Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 to 28 says, so God created man in his own image, and the image of God created he him, male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. I put this verse in here because it's important to show that everything that God has created has a purpose, right? The purpose of God creating men and women, and each of them have different roles, right? A woman is supposed to be a helpmate to a man, right? The, they were, the two of them were made to be fruitful, 
multiply, replenish the earth and subdue it. That was the purpose of God making two different genders, male and female. And it's important to note that the genders, right, were actually instituted even before marriage was instituted, right? God put that in place. Like at the beginning of the creation, when God created, when God created animals as well, he had he made them male and female. So why is it so difficult for people these days to understand that that is how God intended it? It just leaves you to wonder what kind of delusion are people feeding themselves and forcing others to accept? And then we have it reiterated again in Genesis chapter two, verse one, uh, sorry, Genesis chapter five, verse one to two, it says, in that day, God created man in the likeness of God, he made them male and female. He created them and blessed them and called their name Adam, which means man in the day when they were created. Today in America, the LGBTQ community claims to be marginalized, right? However, their flag flies over nearly every government building and even on the White House. The, there was this, there was a pride parade, what, was it last Sabbath? It was a last a pride parade in DC and they had the huge pride flag hung up on the White House between two American flags. And it was just so sad to see, it truly was. Because a flag is supposed to represent the people of the nation, right? The majority. But majority of these people are not, do not abide, and majority of Americans do not abide by the flag. And it's a narrative that people are pushing. Oh, that these people are so brave and whatnot. And it's, it's just, completely destroying what America was built on, right? It, America was built on the word of God, on belief in God, and yet they're slowly coming in and chipping away at everything that make, made America, you know, God's nation. One would think that the community is being celebrated rather than ostracized. The people who are being ostracized are those who are speaking up and out against LGBTQ ideologies in school, which are brainwashing children and convincing them to be dissatisfied with how God made them and to, and to change themselves and mutilate their bodies. Feelings are valid, but they do not point to objective truth. Feelings are valid, but they are not facts. When God said we need to be born again, he did not mean transgenderism. Transgender ideology specifically is Satan's crude counterfeit of creation and the mockery and is a mockery of the teaching of Christ that Christians need to be born again. Only it requires bodily mutilation instead of death to self, and it requires the inward and outward defacement of the body. It is the undermining of God's creative genius and the destruction of his image in us. Being true to ourselves is always a false choice when it means going against God's words. And this is very true because, you know, the thing that seems right to, the way that seems right to a man in the end leads to death. Okay, so it's never worth going against God's word. God's word is life. Anything else, any other feeling that we might have? will likely lead us to our own demise. So combating homosexuality, we need to protect youth and children. While prayer and the Bible have been removed from schools across America and the world, pride and its ideology have taken its place on the walls and in the classroom. Children are being brainwashed to accept sin and our sinful nature is all we are and must be accepted and tolerated. As Christians, we need to pray now more than ever, to study the Bible now more than ever, so that we can know where we stand in relation to that movement. And if you're struggling with such tendencies, fast and pray for God to deliver you from that evil spirit. To those struggling with this sin, forgivable and changeable through Christ Jesus, however ungodly and undeserving of heaven, 
any homosexual might be, there is an opportunity to be forgiven, changed, and declared righteous through Jesus Christ. Paul continues in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11 to say, some of you are like this. We read this earlier. The Corinthian church evidently contained some former homosexuals who had been converted. Furthermore, Paul adds of them that you were washed and you were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the spirit of our God. The homosexual who repents and receives and believes receives the same cleansing, sanctification, and justification as every other believer who turns from sin and to Christ. In closing, Satan has many counterfeits to what God has created, and homosexuality is one of them. It is not a sin to be tempted, but it is a, it is a sin to yield to the temptation. Ask God to search your heart and remove the seeds that may have been planted in your mind or the hereditary tendencies you may have towards it. This is not only with regards to homosexuality, but it is for every sin. God will heal you. He will free you. Remember that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. God made you and he loves you. Never change for society or for Satan. Let God lead your life. Trusting God will land you in heaven. Amen and amen.